while he was on his way to go check them. <laughs> and his people believed him. <laughs> so, there could be <laughs> There he is. And here's that man in action, right? Thought in action. And it is what? The person who is not just the commander, he is what? The head of the government as well. He's combined both. And he's thinking in the midst of a major offensive, right? That captures the context of this great picture. Um, there's this terrain. Not easy terrain to fight in. Sometimes I feel like a, I shouldn't be doing history because my life is in an ivory tower and I know it's like this, <laughs> no action. And sometimes my head hurts and it's like this. But uh, go back to that picture my wife took. Let me just, um, I think we're almost done. I'm almost done. I know we are. The famous order he gives is on the 1st of September. It, starts the pursuit of the Greeks in the midst of conflict. Um, can you hear me now? Okay. So there is now the army collapsing and he's giving the order of the pursuit. He says, armies, your first goal is the Mediterranean. Forward. That line gets quoted all the time. Right? But let's look at it deeper and put it into a context and find out what's going on. Just, I don't want to do the whole thing. As an army goal, to say head for the Mediterranean is not the best order. You want to say what? Head for Izmir or go after the army. The Mediterranean, I think, symbolizes, like he says later on, Turkey has historically been moving westward. And when we're done fighting, we're going to unify more deeply with more systematic reforms to connect with the West. But the sentence before it, to me, is powerful. I want everyone to continue competing in demonstrating their mental powers. Initiative, use your mind, fulfill my order, the idea as a commander, I have to create a climate of initiative, right? In noble way. And this is the most powerful part. I want everyone to continue competing and demonstrating their mental powers and their sources of courage and patriotism. Hamiet could be also zeal, right? What he's basically saying is to each of the soldiers in his army, Whatever motivates you to have courage, to fight for this country, go to that. It is what? Individualizing a command for the army. I'm not going to tell you, do it for Islam. Do it this way. Whatever gives you the courage to do this, do it. Because he understands there are a lot of things that could go on in motivating troops, is there not? Now, Putting it in a context. Uh, what struck me was this order goes to the army. The next day, it appears in Hakimiyeti Milie, the official newspaper. So this is not an order for the army, it's an order for the world. Let the world know what we're about. And as this order is being printed, what happens on the 2nd of September? The Turkish army captures the front commander, some of his senior commanders, and on a Turk can reach out with his hand and say, here's with conscience. Think about conscience, right? What he has demonstrated is strategic kudoyo, an intuitive sense of timing, when to make the order, not too soon, not too late. I didn't put this in my book, but I think you could argue that Wisdom and genius could be shaped by culture. Ataturk talks a lot about patience. So you would expect a person with a more patient, relaxed mode of leadership to wait a little longer before they make a bold statement, right? Your chances of success are better. We in America might be wanting to more quick action, make it fast, and this was a little too slow of a thing to say, but 
I can't help but think, I'm sorry if I offend anyone, I can't think, help whenever I talk about this or think about this, I can't help but think of Bush, Gulf War, going on the aircraft carrier and claiming victory. How long could it be? All right? Okay, uh, now to end up, let me just put this thing. Ataturk has problems with health. Numerous reasons have been cited. Um, war has taken a toll, but from the battle, the Great Offensive, to the Treaty of Lausanne, he makes a major tour of Anatolia, Western and Southern Anatolia, to reach out and touch people, to send them the message of what we're going to do. That's energy, right? You ain't going to waste any time. And one of the speeches he gives, it's amazing, I would call it a State of the Union, where he talks about what we do in the United States. He talks about all the things that Turkey has to do to reform itself, to, to recapture, uh, to, to develop economically, politically, socially. He talks about education of both men and women, neat scientists, doctors, engineers, young people will continue to go to Europe, places for education. And we need human beings who possess serious emotion. Conscience, mind, the themes start coming as he's transitioning to being a full statesman and leaving the war behind. So what does this leave with 1923? If you appreciate more Ataturk as a military commander and his transitioning, it puts this founding of the Republic in a better context. What does it mean? Uh, clearly Ataturk had a vision for the future. It doesn't have to be completely articulated with a blueprint. Commanders wouldn't do that about war plans. I don't think he would miss them. You would expect him to make decisions along the way to execute some of the fundamentals he wants to do. But it's going to go up and down depending on time, OK? And what he is giving is a leader who is a Kamal in the sense of a process. That process will drive Turkey for its next 15 years. An energy scene in that no war situation, no peace, no war situation is going to continue to give headaches to people as he's making changes uh, faster than many of them would like. And in there will be the dynamic that he learned as a young individual, the power of the mind, conscience, values, and emotions need to be integrated in for the whole society as it is has to be for the whole individual. And that gives a powerful intellectual context, content to reform. Not loosey-goosey, feelings, little things like this. It, what Clausewitz would say, these are principles that are flexible, but they're principles that drive. Because you work within that context, right? You understand when you look at people what's going on. Um, so, the integrative and comprehensive mind will be driving this with, uh, with the realities of war. Now, how should I end this lecture? Let me say, I want to be profound. And I'm going to give you a profound endings this lecture. <laughs> I promise you. I say it with confidence, okay? I'm going to look to auditor for inspiration. Here is that book. Notice how many times I've quoted it. It's a little thin book. He says in there to his friend, he said, I read your book three times. I think the book is 150 pages. I read it several, just to absorb what you're trying to tell me before I respond to it. He is clearly an ambitious individual. You have to be to go that far. Some students say you have to be somewhat arrogant to lecture people in front of audiences, right? to think you had something to share. You've got to struggle with that, right? Let me share what, what was so profound with me, is the way this book ends. For a person who wants to make himself know, ambitious, the last three pages of this book are notes he took from commanders, people who sent him messages during the Libyan campaign. He lets the last words be those of his soldiers. And the last line 
is this what the soldier says. And he's appealing to conscience, emotion, patriotism, touching people that way, right? It's not just words. He says, this is what one officer wrote him. In order not to break the morale of my troops, I will not withdraw from the line of battle. If I die, Renzi is at my side. He will direct my forces. Take that example and think about it. Take that example and think about reform for this country. Or what about the country later on? The drive is going to be full of energy, right? Like the energizer of Buddy. The batteries will keep going until he dies, right? Almost. almost. So how will I end this? Um, sacrifice was very big for him. You all familiar with this quote that I'm going to give you. But I, unlike, it seems like a lot of, because I was dealing more with military and emotions, I had to bring it into the book. It's not in, in a lot of the classic books. It's the famous speech he sends to Anzac in 1934. The context is what? Fascism in Italy, Hitler's on his way to the Nuremberg, militarism is on its rise, and I'll read these, you're all familiar with them. But read them with a little bit more heart, conscience, and emotion like Anatoly would ask. It goes like this, the 25th of April, 1934. Those heroes, who shed their blood and lost their lives. You are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore, rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mehmeds to us, where they lay side by side here in the country of ours. You, the mothers who sent their sons from faraway countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. Having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. There's a famous, he said to Vic Vicret, gave of the revolutionary spirit. Go to spirit. Uh, and there's a famous line from his, uh, it, it captures Ataturk uh, in some ways. I am a poet whose thought is free, whose culture is free, whose conscience is free. The famous line from, from Vic Vicret. So those were the two ornament ones. I, 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 I think he had con uh, familiarity with the because he mentioned a couple of German ones, so he was aware of poetry in other countries, but I didn't have time to dwell in on that. Yes, sir? I'd like to relate to you one of the points you made in your lecture was his view toward the West, getting people to look toward the West. That quote that you made appears on his statue in his beard, right on the bottom of it. And I was assigned there as a young foreign service officer. I memorized that right away in Turkish. Yeah. Or do a lot of news, you can get that news, Octanese, the Ilani. I looked at that later and it says to the Med it says to the Mediterranean, and they'd be staring at out at the Aegean. <laughs> it's because he's meant toward the West. Exactly. Right. That's what exactly. And if there's one thing that I sometimes get frustrated about as, a, as an academic is that um, what is powerful about Ataturk is at, at a certain level, you really want it to connect with humanity, right? One society, one culture, one civilization. And we too often think in terms of Islamic civilization, uh, we divide the world. And, uh, and still, in, in my church, when I go, people say, oh, you've come back from Turkey. I bet you're glad to be back. <laughs> well, I am glad to be back, but I'm sad to have left. <laughs> right? 
there is this kind of sense of otherness. We're too deeply involved in it. And here is a leader who says, we need to break that down. We need to make friends with the Greeks. We need to make friends with others, right? And create that one. That's so important for an individual. That's so important for a reform movement. And nationalism certainly was there too in him, right? Proud to be a bird, right? Uh, which, you know, yeah, so, I mean, it's a complex world. But that idea, like you say, reach out, let's go there. But it doesn't mean that we can't ignore the Japanese. In that conversation, he does talk about what the Japanese army did. And he calls them Shahid, Shekadat. They performed martyrdom in their country for their people. Yes? Uh, I wonder about the uh, technocratic, pragmatic aspects of the formation of the republic. Uh, I understand that he was instrumental in starting Ishpakas uh, and in uh, setting economic policy as well as the uh